This week, we finish off our Yellowstone journey with the upper Grand Loop Road, including wonderful waterfalls, mud pots, and canyons. Plus, we have the top five campground office complaints, a new winterizing system, and so much more. This is the RV Miles Podcast. RV Miles is brought to you by L.L. Bean, your source for warm, cozy styles this fall. For 108 years, L.L. Bean has staked their reputation on making comfortable clothing and gear to help you enjoy the healthy benefits of being outside. From legendary main-made boots to layers that are just the right weight to flannel shirts that out-cozy all others. Find joy in the tried and true. Visit LLBean.com to find a store or shop now. L.L. Bean. Be an outsider. Welcome to episode 165 of the RV Miles podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two full-time travelers who, along with our boys, Jack, Ethan, and Henry, are crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip. Each week, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from travel destinations to gear, industry news, our national parks, and a whole lot more. We're, uh, we're continuing to come to you from the same area we were at last week. <laughs> <laughs> we're going it's been a quiet week. <laughs> it's been a very quiet week. There have only been two or three RVs in this campground, which has been lovely. It's been great. In fact, at one point, we felt like we had the whole place to ourselves. Which is wild because we were talking last week about how Custer was so busy and they were yeah. talking about reopening some of the campgrounds that had closed in Custer. Uh, but this place is dead. We just moved, what, 50, 60 miles yeah. from Custer, and it's absolutely night and day, and we are loving it. Now, I know in the warmer climates, it is is quite a different story right now. People are leaving this area because it's starting to get cold, but it was just 90 degrees in Kansas City. Yeah, it's going to be 87 <laughs> here today. We have this week and all next week with beautiful fall weather, and it's gorgeous outside. The colors are just popping. Jason has really enjoyed leaf peeping. It has... oh, you had to bring up that word. <laughs> oh, I hate I had, that phrase. I know. I had to do it just <laughs> for you. It would not be a fall RV Miles episode if we did not at least get leaf peeping in once. <laughs> All right. Well, even though this campground is empty, uh, because lots of campgrounds across the country are busy, I'm sure there are lots of Issues happening at campgrounds <laughs> as often do arise. Our friends over at RVTravel.com have put together a list. In fact, it was Nancy Dixon, one of their writers, who's also a regular camp host, and she put together a list of the top five complaints that campground offices field <laughs> <laughs> that they handle. So, if, you know, guess what you what you think they might be, but we're going to run down what these top five ones are. We're going to start with number five. What do you think number five is? You're going to ask me to I guess before you tell Should me. I? Okay. I know. I just, I wasn't prepared to make a guess. Uh, number five, I'm going to say is probably, can you make sure dogs stop barking? <laughs> no, that is no? on the list. But <laughs> number five is yuck. The restrooms are dirty. Oh, see, I thought that would be higher <sighs> up. Like, Unless this is number five is the worst and one or the worst, like the biggest no. complaint. Okay. It, you know, the things that I, people care about sometimes, believe me, dirty restrooms are high up there on my list as well. Uh, they're but. way up there for me. <laughs> it's very common for campgrounds to have dirty restrooms and it's very common for campers to leave restrooms Oh, Very dirty. Yeah. It's not nature's problem that the restrooms are dirty. Okay. <laughs> Wildlife didn't go in there and make that mess. Yeah. Some some campgrounds clean their restrooms three times a day. Some campgrounds clean them three times a week. Again. Some maybe three times a month. <laughs> not nature doing that. That is all human led. Number four is a site complaint. My site isn't level or it's too muddy. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Now, there are some campgrounds that have their sites are built poorly so that the water pools in them and mm -hmm. that that can be a real problem if you're in a rainy area and what are you going to do about that other than backing into your muddy site you're sitting in your rv and you just feel yourself <laughs> slightly sinking down a little bit more a little bit more 
Yeah. Now the the my site is not level thing though. I go back and forth on whether or not that's a justified complaint. I think all RVers should be expecting to level their RV mm-hmm. to some extent. But if the site is so far on level that it's very, very difficult, yeah. then I then I could understand that. You know, if sometimes there's a, like a steep downhill and you couldn't in a trailer, it, that's one of the things that we have enjoyed transitioning from a, a motorhome, our, our bus conversion to a trailer, is that it is a little bit easier to level in the trailer. Yeah. Well, you know, in the bus conversion, we were leveling thanks to some wooden blocks yeah. that you had put together. I right. mean, it wasn't the easiest with those big giant wheels and how heavy we were to actually find something that we could level safely with. So you actually created something. Yeah. Now here, I think it's in the trailer. It's just our size, our weight, and how we position ourselves when we get into a campsite is a little bit different now. And so I think that that makes it a little yeah, bit well, easier. And it's equipped with things that... Yeah, front to back, you get to deal with the you know the yeah. tongue jack makes leveling front to back easy. So you only have to worry about the left to right in a, right. In a trailer like ours. Now, a lot of motorhomes and fifth wheels have... Uh, automated leveling systems and all that sort of stuff. We're not fancy like that. No, and you know what? (laughs) No, we are not fancy like that. And you know what? I even, I complained about this last week, so I will own that. I mean, as much as I say, is it or is it not the campground or the campsite's fault? I absolutely black tanked our unlevel site at Custer last week. But I also, and you were really good to point this out, 50% of that needed to be on us. Yeah. Because of the way we came we into the site. Absolutely. We could have moved. We could have adjusted it. So we had to own it. And so, you know, reflecting back on my black tank last week, maybe I was a little too quick to judge. And I'll own that. I was really tired well, of not being able to use our water and a little exhausted when we recorded that podcast and grumpy. I, I would venture to guess that most of the complaints about level sites are people that have automated leveling systems and the site is so unlevel yeah. that their system cannot level their And that's frustrating. RV. Yeah, so if you, you know, especially if you're going to a state park or a federal park, um, sometimes it's best to call and ask about that kind of information, especially if it's really going to affect whatever your setup is. Yeah, if you can get them to answer. Right, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. We, we had we called this place you, Ingo, so many times to see when they were shutting their water off and yes. never got an answer until until about the <laughs> we decided to just you know hedge our bets and go with it because the weather looked really good but we also knew the reason why we were calling is a the website said after October first the water could be shut off call the park but also we knew that when we were here two years ago and the weather was very different much colder they had already shut off the water so we knew it could potentially be. A reality. So I did email them as suggested. I did call and leave a message as suggested. I did call and leave a message for the park manager <laughs> as suggested. Uh, I did follow up to my email as suggested. Uh, and it took a week to get somebody to give me a response. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think some of these parks are a little short staffed right now because they, they probably we haven't are. seen a single person that works here drive no. through here. Uh, in that's a week. not, you know what? <laughs> I will say I did actually see somebody yesterday who came over and cleaned the bathrooms. And okay. that was very, it was very nice to see a truck that had South Dakota's you know, <laughs> state park emblem on the side. It was nice to know there's actually someone here in the park. Number three is, is what you suggested for number five is quiet those barking dogs. Now, now, uh, I know you said that because you've seen people complain about that in Facebook groups all the time. Yes, but yes. We have rarely experienced. Oh no! Like, lots of barking dogs. It's like no. it's such a common complaint that people have. But I, I I just have never had a camping experience interrupted by dogs that bark too much. You know what, Jay? Though I think you and I are maybe a little tone deaf to those kinds of sounds because we travel with children barking children (laughs) well you said it not me okay you said it just for the record kids if you ever go back and listen to this but i do think that our our tolerance of a noise level while we always want to be considerate of others when we're at a campsite and want to do the best to contain our noise level we also have been living with heightened noise for 13 years (laughs) so a dog barking probably isn't going to register with me 
as disruptive. Yeah. I mean, we had friends say to us, oh, did you hear that car alarm go off at 3 a.m.? It woke me up, you know, and they're one site next to us. And I go, nope, didn't hear that car alarm. <laughs> no. Like, my brain has just tuned anything like that out in order to keep me asleep or get the thing done I'm working on. So that one to me is not something that I pay too much attention to. Number two is something that I have seen a lot and mm -hmm. does bother me yeah. often is dogs off a leash. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it. I, I get it. Man, these dogs in this lifestyle, I, it's tough. I, I get it. They want to go out and play, and it's great when there's a dog park. And, you know, to me, even every now and then if a dog goes off a leash, if there are no other dogs around and it's not an aggressive dog, that's probably okay. But... Mm. But there are people that have their dogs off the leash all the time. And it's not just about your dog. It's about the other dogs. And well, it's what, about the other people, them. too. It's about the people. Yeah. Everything. I, don't, I don't let my children run into your campsite and jump up on top of you. Well, and so, if, if I you have... know, perhaps you shouldn't let your dog do the same. That, you know, it's that idea. And I think, too, for me, because we have children that are, are somewhat timid around bigger dogs because of interactions they've had in the past where they have had a dog lovingly jump on top of them but overwhelm them. When dogs are off leashes and they're bigger dogs, that's really uncomfortable for the kids. Well, if you have, when we've been camping with a toddler or if, if you have a small dog and you somebody near you has their dog off the leash, your, your entire time there is spent wondering and worrying and watching or just mon and monitoring, just monitoring and monitoring your own kids interaction because again you know you don't know if you were to approach that dog or if that dog was to you know view you as slightly aggressive and this is not a knock at dogs in fact you know we have been having a discussion around here lately uh, because somebody in our family really, really, really wants a dog. Yeah, some campgrounds are like, it has to be a six-foot leash and, you know, all that. Oh, and yeah, I, that stuff's silly. To me, as long as the dog is leashed enough to where they're staying in your yeah. sight, that's fine. I just think it's all situational. Yeah. Everything you do as a camper is situational. There is no one size fits all when it comes to camping. You assess the situation and recognize that you are sharing a space with others. And then you make your best judgment, you make your best call on that. And sometimes that does mean making a call that maybe isn't the one you want to make, but you do it anyway. What do you think is the number one complaint to campground offices? Your camping prices are too high. <laughs> no, I, I think those people just don't end up at okay. the campground. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 the number one is my neighbors are too loud oh boy and thank you for not uh -oh. saying the eppersons are too loud <laughs> look i mean we uh -oh. you know we've had to tell our kids you know we've had to talk to our kids about being too loud now and then but generally i think the concern is not is not kids although people do complain about kids quite often but generally you it's think people it's being too loud too late Oh, sure. I mean, there's a cutoff time for a reason. Uh, I think it's that newfangled rock and roll all those kids are listening to as well. You know, well, we've, yeah. we've had, we were just talking about this yesterday when we had that experience at Echo Basin where there was a group of campers together and they left for the day, brought their awning in, put their chairs away because it was windy, but left the outdoor speakers on and just kept playing their music. Now, and so for hours... <laughs> We just had their music. We thought it was a mistake. Uh, you know, an right, accident, like, easy, but right. they did it twice. <laughs> yeah. I, so either it's just a mistake where they live 24-7 with music always in the background. But part of me was like, no, I really do think that they're, they, they either they think they're doing us a service. <laughs> right. Or, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But that that to me is one of those, my neighbors are loud. But at the same time, I was like, well, it's just music and it's a Saturday afternoon and whatever, you know, like we'll put up with it. Three o'clock in the morning, if they were doing that, maybe that's a different story. <laughs> well, if you want to read that article, head over to rvmiles.com slash 165. The show notes for this episode also in the YouTube uh, description. You can find it there as well. And you'll find the link to this article and go over to rvtravel.com. And, you know, their big thing is newsletters. Subscribe mm -hmm. to their newsletters because they're 
They're pretty awesome. They're a great people. As I don't well. know how they do it. I, I do either. one a week. Well, they've got a staff, but <laughs> it's it's Fair it's rough. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the kids to get older so I can have a staff. <laughs> we have been asking you for the last several weeks if you do want to find a way to support RV Miles. We uh, have been coming up with different options for you that are that are really easy and free to do. And this week, our weekly ask for you is to consider using our Amazon affiliate link if you are going to be purchasing anything on Amazon. All you have to do... If. Did you just say if <laughs> you're going to be... When. I think really that sentence is when you purchase something on Amazon. We've made it really easy now. All you have to do is type in amazon.rvmiles.com and that will take you to the Amazon homepage, but it's got our affiliate link baked in. So anything you purchase, we get a tiny little kickback for. It doesn't cost you any additional money. And if you use, uh, if you use like Smile Amazon, mm -hmm. where where you're uh, giving back to charity when you purchased from from Amazon as well, it still works with that. Right. So, so you can spread the love. For sure. And, you know, these weekly asks, we really, really appreciate them. And we have seen y'all going out there and doing that for us. And again, it just really warms our heart to all of you who came over and joined us on Instagram last week. Thank you so much. With the holiday season coming, if you can just keep RV Miles in the back of your thoughts as you go to Amazon and make those purchases just using amazon.rvmiles.com. We would really, really appreciate it. And we thank you in advance so very much. While you're over at Amazon, you might want to take a look at something that really uh, caught my eye. Did you buy it? As, no. I, Am I going to have to go pick this up in Rapid City? Is that uh, what you're saying? <laughs> uh, this it, It's a device that goes in, in your RV installed onto your water system. It's called the Flow. F-L-O-E. And the E has the umlauts over it. Okay. Okay. All right. And this, what this is, is a, a small onboard DC powered air compressor that is built into your water system so that you can blow all of the water out of your system oh. for winterizing without having to get a separate compressor and hook it up to, you know, hook it up to a hose, hook it up to your water fill, all that sort of stuff. So this would be really great for people who are wanting to extend into the fall late when it's, you know, you're you're not full time like us, but you're going out for uh, a few days at a time and you have to winterize when you get back. You could use this. You just flip it on and then go through and turn open all your faucets. You could use this, you know, as part of your breakdown, leaving a campsite. Oh, so, that's such a good idea. And then you just fill back up with water next time you're camping. Yeah. We were just talking about like blowing out the lines and stuff and how you felt like it wasn't quite yeah, the I mean, safest for... way to winterize. And this sounds like maybe a way to like double down on that and really make sure you're not leaving anything in there. I still prefer to use the liquid antifreeze for mm -hmm. a, you know, for a deep winter winterization. But for fall... And for intermittent, when you're going back and forth yeah, between yeah. camping, I think this is great. If you're going to be leaving your rig for a couple months in storage, I still would use the liquid stuff if you're in cold enough climate, you know. Yeah. Um, Which is what we right. are looking at having to do right. in just a couple months. Uh, so there you go. Um, check that out over on Amazon. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes as well at rvmiles.com slash 165. Fall is here, so it's time to start thinking about prepping for the winter off-season. Whether you own an RV, travel trailer, or camper, EmpireCovers.com is here to help protect all your vehicles against Mother Nature. EmpireCovers.com offers high-quality, affordable covers that are engineered to protect. Every cover comes with a free multi-year warranty to guarantee that it remains durable over time. RV Miles listeners can receive free shipping plus an extra 15% off their entire order. Visit EmpireCovers.com slash RV Miles or use promo code RV Miles at checkout. EmpireCovers.com. Protect what you love. It's time for the answer to last week's brain teaser. The malpractice suit. <laughs> the malpractice suit. Which went like this. <laughs> Dr. Rob was staying with cousin Ralph in Ralph's RV in a beautiful wooded lakeside campground in a national park. The two had come together for the camping trip to set up Ralph's will. As Rob was Ralph's closest living relative, much of Ralph's estate was being left to him. 
One day, Ralph went to Dr. Rob very disturbed. Doctor, he began, I have just found out that an assassin wants to get me. He will be here very soon. Where will I go? Where can I hide? If he finds me here, he'll surely kill me. I do not have time to leave this campground to go further into the woods. Dr. Rob thought for a moment, then grabbed a five-foot-long bamboo pole with a diameter the size of a quarter. Ralph, follow me to the lake. The lake is four feet deep. If you lie on the bottom of the lake and breathe through this pole, the assassin will never find you. I will swim down to get you when he is gone. Ralph consented and lay down on the bottom of the lake with the bamboo pole in his mouth. A few hours later, a ranger passed by. He found Ralph's body dead. Dr. Rob told the police of the circumstance and that Ralph had probably panicked and died. Police arrested Dr. Rob on the charges of murdering Ralph. Why? Okay, first, I have to go back to something that just jumped out at me last week that we didn't talk about, but now I just feel like I got to talk about it. Ralph doesn't have enough time to leave the camp. Doesn't have time. Enough, yet he time. has enough time for Dr. Rob to get some bamboo and fashion this whole thing and take him down to the lake. That's in correct. 15 seconds, Ralph could be in his car You've driving to the police station. You have you have yet to watch Ozark, and you need to watch Ozark, and then you Why? understand because all this. Dr. Rob is on <laughs> Ozark? <laughs> uh, one of the answers we got was that, that bamboo has ribs in it and that wouldn't be open all the way to the top, which is not the answer that we were looking for. But, but it was a good one. Hey, they must watch one. Ozark. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> the idea here was that he actually could get air in and out. The, the, the issue, okay. however, is that the pole being five foot long and only the diameter of a quarter, he's not getting the air all the way out and new air in, so he would pass out. Why didn't he stand up? Because he doesn't. Because he's passing out. He doesn't know when, when you pass out due to carbon dioxide. You don't I, know it. Look, I, this is there are there are as many holes in this as Doctor Rob's bamboo pole. Okay? Or an episode this, of Ozark. So or clearly an episode of Ozark. I I can't with it. All right, let's move on. Jay. Okay. All right. <laughs> but I have to add that because Doctor Rob was a doctor, he should have known this. And that's well, why, you know, that's why the police knew. It doesn't, so Dr. Doesn't really Rob is either. the assassin. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is exactly what I said last week. All right. We are here today to talk about the final portion of our Yellowstone National Park visit. The upper portion Ooh. of the Grand Loop Road, the upper circle. Um, now, we'll say the, the eastern portion of this part of the park, uh, the, the road, from tower to canyon was closed the entire time mm -hmm. we were there. It is still closed. So we weren't able to visit that part of the park. So we did uh, probably about uh, two thirds of this this yeah. segment. So but, goals. but still only goals. did uh, you know a tenth of what's available to do in, oh in this part of the park. But barely touched anything. <laughs> I want to start in the canyon area, which I guess could be considered on the upper or lower loop because it's in the middle. And the canyon area is where the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone is. It's, you know, other other rivers other than the Colorado have a Grand Canyon. It's the biggest canyon on the on the Yellowstone River. It, it's its Grand Canyon. It's probably the second most popular site in the park next to Old Faithful is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and particularly Lower Falls. Mm -hmm. Lower Falls is a 308-foot waterfall that is the biggest in the park and it is absolutely gorgeous and yeah. uh and you know we spend a couple hours going over there and checking the canyon out in the waterfall it was not a bad way to spend my birthday it was your birthday it was, it was my was birthday nice. and we enjoyed a beautiful day and just some of the most iconic views in the park and it was another fairly quiet day as well which was wonderful cuz we were going to such a popular location and it was thrilling. I, you're hard pressed to find anywhere in Yellowstone that's not going to take your breath away. And it doesn't have to be something as, you know, visually giant as, you know, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone doesn't hurt. But there's nothing you can do in this park that's going to make you miserable. Now, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, the way to visit it is there's a, a, a loop road that takes you uh, along the rim of the canyon. And there are probably a dozen places to view Lower Falls and sort of the spectacular view of the canyon. 
you don't have to go to all of them. I no. mean, several of them offer a similar view and some of them offer a little different view. But we started with the brink of the Lower Falls Trail, which is really cool because you actually see Upper Falls on your way down it, uh, which is just as spectacular, but mm-hmm. further away. And this trail is a whole bunch of paved switchbacks. That's all it is. Just uh, take your Tylenol before you go. Pretty if you've steep got knees down. <laughs> yeah, the, the way down's not too bad. On the way up is uh, was uh, a little rough. It was, you know what? For me personally, actually, I find down just my knees hate going down. And so when we got to the bottom, I was like, oh, thank goodness. Do you end at the very top of the waterfall? So you're wow. watching the water go over the waterfall. Yeah. It's a really spectacular place to see a waterfall to get that close to it. It is. It's amazing how close you get to it. Yeah. And you just, you feel like you're looking right down. You feel the mist. The mist goes up. Yeah. The mist goes Ethan higher didn't. than twice the height of the waterfall. Ethan didn't like it. He did not <laughs> like getting that close to that, well, that drop off. I will say it was also very, very windy the day we mm-hmm. were there. And when that wind yes. sort of blows up the canyon, that's a little frightening to our oh. kids. They've had a few experiences with just sudden wind gusts. <laughs> I think Ethan is still reeling from Mesa Verde. So... You know, I could see why he was like, wind, canyon, I'm out of here. <laughs> so we then drove a bit further down the road and got a view of the full canyon. And that's kind of the extent of the time we spent mm-hmm. in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. We did go over to the Canyon Village area, which is a, uh, another big visitor hub of the park where there's a hotel and a restaurant and gift shops and visitor center and restrooms and all, and all that sort yeah. of stuff and cell signal and cell signal <laughs> you know this also is another stop where you can go if you get passport stamps so you can get a passport stamp here as well as the one that you get over at old faithful this also this particular stop and i was never able to find it again had probably my favorite local beer of all the beers that i had when we were in that area and it was a huckleberry hefeweizen And I could not find it anywhere else, just right there at that canyon store in their little grocery area. And they had quite an awesome selection of local beers. And so I got this one. And then I got the one I've talked about before, which is the Hucket, which is the Big Sky Huckleberry Wheat. Couldn't find the Hefeweizen anywhere else to save my life. But it's nice because you can buy beers right there in the store yeah. and then you can take them to a picnic area, which is exactly and what And they we weren't did. super expensive. I think it was $2.20 a can, which is certainly cheaper than a pint you're going to buy at a restaurant. So I grabbed a couple of cans for my birthday and headed on out down the road. And we had a we had a picnic where we did a little stir fry mm-hmm. on the Blackstone on the back of the pickup truck. Uh, in the awesome. the Norris picnic area, which yeah. was one of our favorites right along the one Gardner River. One of our River. favorites. One of my favorite stops, hands down. Probably my favorite area. Yeah. For sure. Next would be the Norris Geyser Basin, which is right there by that Norris picnic area. The Norris Geyser Basin is another very, very popular area of the park. And uh, it the, you'll you'll notice when you drive up here the amount of Overflow parking wow. uh, signifies how many people come to this area, partially because it is one of those areas that's super convenient to West Yellowstone. And I think Ab- as pr- I think particularly Abby's favorite area in the whole oh, park was sure. the Norris Geyser Basin. Absolutely. And we actually never finished it. <laughs> no, we never didn't. Never walked at all. Went three times. Never actually walked the entire length of the boardwalk, either going towards Steamboat Geyser or going to the right to Porcelain. We never walked both of them all the way. And even the little bit we did, because again, you know, we said this last week, we'll say it again. Most of our time in the park started later in the day. We were really, really, really into being in the park during the golden hour, during dinner, after the sun had set. And so every time we got over to Norris, we were getting there and we were catching a spectacular sunset over there by steamboat. But then we only had this small window of time before it got dark and we didn't feel comfortable being out in a bear aware area, you know, in the dark. So we never finished it. And even though we never finished it, we had some of the coolest most amazing views. Steamboat Geyser is is really special 
even when it's not erupting and it is entirely unpredictable so you don't know when it's going to erupt so i if don't you... think i want to be there when <laughs> it does. They, they have this sign when you come <laughs> into the parking lot that is essentially park at your own risk yeah because the, apparently the acid from the geyser can damage your paint and the parking lot's a long way from the geyser a long way away and some people were not taking chances they covered their cars <laughs> covered their cars they covered their cars we did not when you're there though it's just like you just said, it's so spectacular just to see because the landscape around these geysers, especially if there's a lot of trees around the geysers, they have been completely altered by what is erupting, the, the water that erupts out of these geysers. It's so fascinating to see how they change the landscape. Yeah, and uh, and Steamboat, when it does go off, it goes off pretty darn high. And 300 you can, feet, I think. You can see it from out in the Grand Loop Road if it's if it's a full eruption. Some of them are, are minor eruptions. So if you do see that happening and you're driving through, you do want to pull over there and, and go check it out because it's not, you, you don't, it doesn't erupt. Like I said, it's unpredictable, but it's going to be every few days at, at the most. There is also something to note that in the time of COVID, the visitor center there, the information center, the education center is not open. Yeah, so there's a there's a museum there um, that looks pretty nice, but does have some facilities. There's restrooms and stuff there that you are. can access. There are. In the parking lot, there's a restroom. Right now. But that side of the Norris, Norris Geyser Basin was, was my favorite part because it's so full of like weird, random steam mm-hmm. vents and noises and the earth is like burping and creaking oh, it's so and cool. and then it has a wide open expanse uh towards the setting sun so the sun is like you know coming through the steam of these geysers and and steam vents and and it just looks gorgeous as it comes through there and then we get over to the porcelain geyser area and you know it's sort of like it's named after sort of the milky white shiny look of it but we were there i mean it was it was well after oh, sunset and it almost looked like it was like bioluminescent like it was mm-hmm. glowing i have never sort of been the type of person that gets you know overly excited to the point of where i'm like kids kids get over here quick quick and then i'm like look we're gonna sit here for 10 minutes and i'm gonna make you watch this thing and you know we're gonna be so i'm thrilled and you're gonna be thrilled too i could not stop pulling everybody from one spot to another in just that little bit of section that we did there. You can hear the water bubbling under the ground, under the crust. You can't see it, but you can hear it, which again is like another one of those auditory things that reminds you how alive this earth is, right? It was truly a great place to be at sunset. And I know we've said this a few times, but this is just one of those places where that sun, the second that sun dipped below the mountains, everybody left, and there's still another hour plus of light, and uh, and it's it's we a had gorgeous the whole place time. to ourselves. Yeah. Next, moving up the road up north was probably our kids' favorite area of oh, Yellowstone yeah. National Park. Oh yeah, the artist paint pots. When you say artist, it sounds like it might be colorful or something. It's not like colorful or anything no, but it, no. they're they're mud pots and um what a mud pot is 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 basically another thermal feature of of the park where it just the the, the bloop, 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 bloop. well what what happens like we talked about this with the mud volcano is that the acid in the water melts the mud and melts the dirt and turns it into mud and but here it's like thick and these these things throw mud. They throw sludge up in the air. Yeah, and it depending depending on the time of year is how far the mud is going to or go. Or if it's rained recently. It's sort yes. of like the consistency of the mud. Yeah, so in the spring, you have a better chance of the mud flying so far that not only does it go past you, it hits you. <laughs> now, in the fall, that depending on the weather conditions again and whether or not it had rained, that's not as likely to occur. Poor Henry wanted to be hit by that mud so bad. And the first time we visited, it was really, really active. It had just recently rained. And so there was a little bit more liquid. And it was firing this mud up and it was getting really really close to this boardwalk platform they have for you to go and look and he didn't he didn't want to leave he thought it would just be the most amazing thing if he got pelted 
And unfortunately, it did not happen for him. But now, he was so fascinated was. by it. Now, everything we've talked about so far on this episode is close to the road and mm -hmm. is really easily accessible, even if you're, uh, you know, if you're not very mobile. Artist Paint Pots is a little bit further. It's about it's a, a mile, mile and a half, a little mile, a little well, over a mile a, loop. Yeah, it's closer to a, uh, it's a mile and a half loop total, I think. And it's not yeah. really a loop. It's like there and then around a little loop yeah. and back. But you do have to go up some stairs and some stuff like that. But it is, uh, it's a wonderful spot. Another wonderful sunset spot because mm -hmm. you can see over a giant meadow that often has elk and bison in it. And um, so you get the paint pots or, you know, that's a very kind of a small portion of this area but then there are other geysers and pools yeah, and stuff around here too again it's just another really great spot in yellowstone to check out in fact we went twice because we the kids really loved it so much and it was different both times the consistency of the mud had changed yeah. in between times and that was a really great learning experience for them too to be able to talk about why it's different from literally i think 48 to 36 hours yeah. maybe difference uh, on up the road, we uh, went to the Mammoth area of the park. Now, Mammoth is really interesting because it's home to like these giant thermal constructions that are, uh, they look like huge wedding cakes, mm -hmm. big tiered formations that are crafted from the mineral deposits from these different thermal features in the park. And they are just huge. They're all linked by a big interconnected system of boardwalk walkways again so like a lot of the areas at yellowstone you go and you sort of meander through them and you just sort of wow at how weird this place is there's nothing else on earth like this no. I, it's hard to appreciate that that there's no like there's no other place on earth you can go where you have all of these geysers and thermal features yeah it's pretty amazing that this is our backyard this is our home country and and we have something like this here I will say, I think Mammoth, we just did this once because it's a really, really decent drive from the west entrance. Yes. It was very hot that day, and Mammoth is very exposed. And so we didn't last or stay, I think, as long as we would have liked because we were just so hot. and We were just baking in that sun. And frankly, we were also very hungry. We also had, yeah, we had yeah. a lot to accomplish. So yeah. we wanted to go get get dinner and we got dinner in this area. But you should also know that the Mammoth area is where the park headquarters is. Mm -hmm. It's a very historic area where there's lots of older buildings from back when the army managed the park before yeah. the National Park Service even existed. And again, there's hotels and the Mammoth campground and and all sorts of stuff like that up there. And this is the campground I think we are the most interested in staying at the next time we come back. Well, it doesn't have uh, big length limits, if I remember. Yeah, right. we saw so, some massive yeah. fifth wheels in there. Yeah, so, um, it, and it just seems like, you know, you are you have facilities right there. If you want to go over to the camp store and stuff, yeah. it's all right there. Well, you're close to Gardner as well. You're also, uh, I think there is a trail that's going to connect you directly into kind of the heart of Mammoth there, the park headquarters and the restaurants and everything. It's like a little mile trail. So you have things you can do that don't require you to get in your car. And that's a really nice thing to have when you're in Yellowstone. I think personally, like when I can explore the area without having to get in my car and drive 20, 30 minutes, I appreciate that. And it seems like Mammoth Campground allows you to do that a little bit. Yeah. Now, where uh, West Yellowstone is still a good 20 minutes into the park, into the Grand Loop Road, Gardner, Montana, which is the gateway community at the north end of the park, is only a five mile drive outside of the park. So it's real close. So if you do stay in Gardner, that's a really great place to stay to visit the north end of the park. But it was also a nice drive out for us to go get some uh, some dinner or lunch or whatever we wanted to call it. And anyone want to guess what we got? <laughs> Starts with a P, ends in a za. <laughs> we, uh, we went to a place called Outlaw's Pizza. We did. Outlaw's with an S, though. And they should have made it a Z, though. I, I really wish it was Outlaw's with a Z. <laughs> and we got to-go pizza, and we went to a place called Arch Park, which um, if you're not familiar, there is this giant archway entrance at the north end of the park. It's called the Roosevelt Arch, which was the keystone was laid by Theodore Roosevelt. And it's sort of like this iconic historic entrance to the National Park. And the town of Gardner has a little park 
that is just out just in the shadow of mm -hmm. the Roosevelt Arch. And we sat at a picnic table there and had our pizza dinner. And, and the arch was just framing us. Yeah. Like it was, it's really cool. I absolutely recommend stopping there. Even if you aren't going to go and get pizza, you've got food with you. You know, an RV, a smaller RV could for sure get in over there and get parked. We saw a class yeah. C while we were over there. There's actually a free water fill there too. We saw some is people it, fill in the water. Well, is it free? Uh, Let's not there. say it's free. <laughs> There's water there, and someone was using it. <laughs> I cannot say if it was free, though. It is. It's really cool because across from this park is this like this little tiny cabin like building that cutest. was like the library slash sheriff's office. The cutest <laughs> so thing good. I've yeah. ever seen. I wanted to go in this library so bad. <laughs> it did have outside of it, which I always love seeing this, a free book exchange. Give a book, take a book. So if you're looking for something to read or you have something to donate while you're over there, please go over to this tiny little library sheriff's office and <laughs> share your stuff. Now, when you go into garden, you know, a lot of people like to take a, a photo in front of the entrance sign of the, mm -hmm. the national park, of any national park they visit. That's kind of hard to do at the West Yellowstone entrance, Yeah, which made us very happy to see that the uh, up and gardener they actually have the big entrance sign. It's huge. It's massive. It's, it's massive. taller than me. They have it in the town of Gardner instead of like right at the entrance. So, and it's in a little plaza, but it, it nice has parking. The, like, yeah. The national park is behind it. It's not like buildings behind it or anything. So you can really take your time and, and get a really good photo here. Yeah, and everybody else is taking photos so that you can trade off cameras and stuff. And we got one of our, I think, our best family photos yeah. ever. There at that at that sign. And, you know, often, too, I think, is that it wasn't as busy as everyone who was over at the arch. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing, too. You know, if you do not want to stand around and have to wait a long time to get the picture, then this might be a better option because everyone wanted to do the picture with the Roosevelt Arch. Yeah. And another another quick little tip about signs as you're heading out the northern entrance into Gardner you'll also pass a sign for the 45th parallel, oh, yeah. which is halfway between the equator and the North Pole. It's yeah. wild to me that it's that far north. It's <laughs> crazy. Is still only halfway yeah. to the North Pole from the equator, but you can get your picture taken by that sign as well. So that's our experience at Yellowstone National Park. It was a wonderful. I'm glad you stuck with us for three episodes of this. The park itself is as epic <laughs> as these three podcasts felt like creating. <laughs> you know, we uh, in our time there was much longer than most people get to spend there. Yeah, we didn't hardly cracked the surface of the place we did get to see a, a heck of a lot there's so much more to do you could spend an entire summer there and and not see everything and maybe we will next year i hope so <laughs> When it comes to RV travel, weather safety is a top priority, which is why the Highway Weather app provides weather forecasts for road trips along every point of your route, adjusted to your time of travel. You can compare forecasts, get recommendations for the best time to head out, get severe weather alerts, add rest stops to long trips, and more. Did I mention all of that's included free in the app? For subscribers, there's a hands-free background feature to automatically alert you to upcoming bad weather. And to download the app, visit highwayweather.io today or look for it in your iOS or Android app store. It is time to check the level of our tanks. Abby, what is in your black tank this week? So my black tank is actually more of a gray tank okay. this week. So my gray tank is really just about uh, campgrounds that up here in the Midwest and up in the North are already starting to close for the season. And we have felt this way for the whole four years that we have been on the road, that these could really be extended much longer than they are. Yeah. And that really came back to play again as we have been looking for somewhere to go as we want to stay in this area in hopes that we can go and visit family for the holidays. And that has been almost impossible because most campgrounds on the state and federal, which is what we're trying to stick with because we really do want to get back to that part of our camping life, are closing by the 15th of this month the 20th of this month. Some have already closed by the 1st of October. A lot of the ones around Yellowstone, some of them were even closed September 5th or yeah. 15th. 
And of course, we could move much further south and we wouldn't be having any issues. But again, we're just trying to limit the amount of driving we're doing. We want to slow. We've really had the theme of slow travel as much as possible this year, staying in places as long as we can. And so we haven't we had just haven't been able to find anywhere. And it's 83 degrees it's, here today. It is. It's actually 87 is the high for today. And it's going to stay like that all through the weekend and into next week. It's beautiful. And this time of year in the Midwest and in the North, when fall starts to pop, is just the most perfect time you want to be camping I would love to stay up here in the Midwest and be able to enjoy this part of the country through the fall season, but it's just not possible. A lot of private campgrounds are staying open a little bit later than they normally would this year to accommodate, but but state and federal parks just kind of, you know, they, they just do what they, they do. They do what's, what and they do. <laughs> again, this is just a gray tank. It's more just about kind of our desire of what we wish we could do, but it up against what the reality is. And so we have had to make the decision that to continue to be somewhat close to family, should we decide that it's safe to go visit for the holidays, we're going to have to go to the Tulsa area. And even going to the Tulsa, Oklahoma area, we were still limited, northern Oklahoma even, is closing a lot of their federal and state campgrounds for the season. So it's just a gray tank. I wish we could stay up here longer. We can't. We'll get to enjoy the fall a little bit more for one more week. Then we're just going to have to move where freezing temps, potentially, if the weather decides to shift. Right now it's staying beautiful up here if freezing temps decide to rain down on us and we got to go. What is in your fresh tank? So my fresh tank this week goes to the Great British Baking Show, which just released a whole bunch of new episodes. It couldn't be coming at a better time. This is one of those shows that just radiates joy for me. It's a show that I go back to and just rewatch. It's like my West Wing. You will sit and watch the West Wing over and over and over Well, that's how I feel about the Great British Baking Show. And they have a whole bunch of new episodes on Netflix. I absolutely recommend them. If you are looking for something that is not divisive during a very divisive time, you want to go and you want to watch this and you just want to celebrate the joy of baking. And you want to hope for a Hollywood handshake. Everybody wants a Hollywood handshake. That... That, it's amazing. It's that does amazing. not sound like an appropriate <laughs> term to me. That does not sound like sounds like it sounds what like it's something about? else. Is all I'm going to say. It's a it's a Hollywood <laughs> handshake. <laughs> all right, Jay. What is in your black tank this uh, week? My, you know, we've been talking about the need for new campgrounds uh, quite a bit, and there are some being built, but even most of the money that's getting put into new campgrounds right now is going to sort of fix up older ones. You know, a lot of investment money is going into buying older parks that already have an established, you know, presence and and fixing them up. But we do need more camping spaces in general. And there's a big problem for a lot of campground developers. There are some that are trying to build brand new campgrounds, but they're facing a lot of pushback from local communities who just don't want them to come in yeah, um, that's a and you know particularly i think it's a it's a lot of times it's the squeaky wheel <laughs> type people it's yeah. the people that go to the city council meetings and go to the community meetings and complain and we have a lot of experience with with those types of people we've been we do when, chicago theater shocking when i worked at the the theater that i, I worked at for uh, quite a long time 10 years was right near wrigley field and the the neighborhood association would have their meetings at our theater and often the alderman was there and such. And, and and anytime the Cubs wanted to make a change or they wanted something new or they want, you know, they just did a big massive redevelopment. They would have to come present their plans at these community meetings and the pushback from these residents who were still complaining about lights being added to Wrigley Field back in 1988. And yet enjoying the fact that their property rose like 50% in value. Oh, no, it probably rose like 5,000% in value. That's not an exaggeration. (laughs) Every time the Cubs would touch something and they would do something to make the experience at Wrigley more enjoyable, 
property value in that area skyrockets. You didn't used to want to go into that area. Now oh, everybody no. wants to live there. Yeah, it has the probably one of the most sought out public schools in the area as well. And yet they do not like don't come at me with your lights in a stadium for night games. Like, don't come at me with that. So a lot of that is happening to campground developers who are getting a lot of, oh, it's going to be a ton more traffic. It's going to be vagrants who are, who are th- th- these felons that are running from the law are going to be living at this campground. And, and they're your <laughs> voice that you do when you're being grumpy um, is like it's grumpy. It's, it's, it's I feel grumpy like guy. I feel like it's based off somebody, you know, in real life. Probably, probably, probably. But they're facing a lot of that. And there are a lot of denials happening to campgrounds who are trying to get, you know, zoning changes or um, approval for their plans. So, uh, you know, hopefully communities will start to realize that, hey, campgrounds are a really good thing right now, especially because they, you know, campers come in and they pay the the lodging taxes, which, you know, lodging taxes in local communities pay for so much stuff that, residents don't have to pay for and they bring in tourism dollars who you know then go visit other shops and restaurants and all that sort of stuff and especially whilst people are still you know it's going to be a long time while people that people will still be leery of going to hotels yeah um and uh, campgrounds are a great option for communities to to bring in people yeah so just stop being so grumpy yeah. listen to what they have to say be open about it and get yourself a campground we'll come visit <laughs> get yourself a campground we're not all vagrants we promise no, but we will bring loud children <laughs> 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 all right jay what is in your fresh tank this week well you know we've been uh grass is greener and all that you know looking at new rvs mm-hmm. uh, quite a bit lately yes you have yes i have mm-hmm. <laughs> and um One thing that really caught my eye that that excited me, and not a lot excites me because a lot of these RVs are the same as they have been for quite a few years. Yeah. Um, There are more options. There are more floor plans. There's little bits of technology in here and there. but The swoops and swirls are becoming less. The colors are being a little bit more modern inside. Yeah, there's some things to be excited about. But something that really turned our eyes was uh, the Wildwood Versa Lounge. Wildwood trailers um, offer this feature called the Versa Lounge. And what it essentially does is it takes this this sort of dinette sofa configuration that we're sitting in right now uh, that a lot of trailers have. There's a dinette right next to a, a sofa. And they they sort of rethought it and thought, well, these, these two things are always next to each other. Let's combine them into something that works together. And what they've done is they made it so like the the back, the middle part of the dinette, the back wall of it that we're leaning against here right now, is removable, which can sort of make uh, the whole dinette sofa area one flat surface for sleeping, which is awesome for adults because adults cannot sleep on these these corner areas to corner. at all. Corner to corner. <laughs> and 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 they also makes it possible for a family like ours, a family of five, to use the the sofa plus the the end of the dinette as an L shaped sofa facing the tv and all five of us can sit on it that sort of thing is really interesting to us but what really excited us was the access to the storage what Mm -hmm. they've done is they've they've made doors that fold flat on the entire underbelly of that whole couch sofa area and and provided bins that slide out like the plastic storage bins plastic totes keyword there is provide the bins actually come that are the right size and everything and so you have access to everything under there because manufacturers, I, I think they don't realize, maybe they do, maybe Wildwood just figured this out, that these areas of storage under the dinette and under the sofa are the most important storage areas we have in this whole RV. We yeah. have so much stuff under these. Yeah, we use them for a lot of things. Yeah, because uh, there's that, just that tiny pass through outside and a pantry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they really do kind of become the catch all for the things that maybe aren't exactly just Jason and I items or just boys items, like the school shoes, uh, podcast equipment, extra coats, towels, you know, because we don't even have a dedicated like closet in our bathroom where we could put towels. So there's always this need to kind of figure out this space. Now, everyone's rig is going to be different. Ours is configured to where, you know, in order to get to this storage, we're taking off cushions, we're lifting up plyboard, 
that's just, I think, this particular price point. But what's great about this, and I don't mean to hijack your conversation, is that they are giving you more quality, more space at a price point that doesn't have to push you way up into more luxury type RV models. They're doing it at the base entry level. And that's that's really nice. Like it's nice to be able to say, you know, it's just it's sort of like saying, hey, we know you're buying an entry level and and we want to, you know, remind you that that purchase is just as good as if you were spending ninety thousand dollars on an RV. You matter just as much to us as the ninety to a hundred to one hundred and twenty thousand dollar RV also on our lot. The the interiors on these things are are really slick mm-hmm. too, and we're seeing a lot of that this year. You know lot of new interior changes this year on on they're really starting to look much better than they have in the past yeah. on, on across lots of different models so wildwood's right up there for us on, as an option the problem is the cargo carrier the capacity ca- we can't we can't make it work pounds. no yeah. we can't make that work it's just not possible for full-time living it's absolutely possible for uh, this being your recreational vehicle that you go on vacations with. But for those of us who do this full-time, 1,200 pounds for a family of five, not at all possible. Maybe we can upgrade the axles or something. I don't know. All right, that's my fresh tank. And uh, let's. <laughs> and it's time to wrap this episode up with a new brain teaser. Through the day, they toiled away. At night, their plight was in disarray. A woman entered the picture, and the changes came. Their lives would never be the same. Then the evil showed up and almost sent her to heaven. Many can name some, but can you name all of this fearless seven? This is so easy. I'm not going to say it, though. It's only easy for you because because of what we've been doing recently. Right, because of one of our recent fresh tanks. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have the answer to that and a whole lot more on next week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, we will. And hey, we would like to remind you that if you are enjoying the RV Miles podcast and we hope you are, please go over to Apple Podcast and leave a five-star review. That just helps put us in front of a whole new group of listeners. And also RV Miles is all across social media. Come connect with us. Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And of course the RV Miles Facebook group. If you haven't joined our email list please come do that as well just go to rvmiles.com slash mailing list phew i think that is it for this week so please take care of yourselves and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode but until then keep logging those rv miles bye everybody bye